like he was just like super with like a single page application where yeah. it's in charge of like I guess I'm gonna get us started on time. Um, I know I have a lot to cover. <laughs> um, uh, I'm excited to have everybody here. I mean, there's 53 sessions that are happening, and I'm happy you guys are here, and we have a lot of people really interested in uh, user experience. Um, I'm Kara Nelson. I have a small web agency. I'm from up near Burlington, Vermont. Did you press the red button? It did. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, from a small town, Huntington, in near Burlington, Vermont. Um, I also teach at Champlain College. Um, I teach an interaction design course there, uh, which has really inspired me more with uh, uh, the user experience because the, when they asked me to teach, they told me I was teaching um, marketing majors and graphic designers, and I might have a few game designers. Well, my whole class ended up being all game designers and one marketing major. And that's when I really realized how this user experience, um, it, it's across many platforms and many processes. Um, and it was a real eye-opener for, for these uh, game designers, um, you know, because they, they, they work on stories and everything, but really learning, you know, who's using it and, and, and using their products. So I have 10 really good superpowers. And because I have a small agency, I'm kind of a one person, my team is actually my clients, their employees, I have to actually work with them and develop a, a, a team for my user experience team for the design process. Um, and one of the key things that I'm forever doing, and I'm sure a lot of you, if you are working out there in user experiences, is I'm forever telling everybody we really need to stop designing for ourselves. We're an advocate for the users. And at every meeting I have, I still have to bring it up, and people have to pull themselves in check. I have to pull myself sometimes. I know something really works, but I'm like, ah, different user, different user. I can't, I can't pull that out of my toolbox. And the other thing, too, is when I meet with a lot of my clients um, and a lot of projects, everybody knows who the user is. And they usually have a really set path of who that one user is. And then we start exploring, investigating, and learning how many other really important people there are that we need to be designing for. And the key thing, too, is that everybody on your team, whether they are a designer or a user experience designer, they can partake and be part of the design process. And I want you to be able to, be able to bring more of these people in and into your teams. Because we're an advocate, if we don't think about those uh, key things, we, we have to be an advocate for the, for the user because as we know, they will end up taking their own path. And we will have done all this work and wasted all this time and um, they're, they're someplace else and, and nowhere that we want to be. So a successful uh, user designer has to cultivate um, a collaborative and a curious and have a really respectful mindset. Because we're involving users, you need to be working with them, um, observing them, and you also have to understand that you're going to come across failure. That design, we design in cycles when we're designing um, user experience. You know, the failures are the good things. You want them to fail. Um, we're starting in the beginning, beginning stages, and that's where um, you have to just understand that we keep going back in circles and cycles. And then back to your team that you are going to be working with non-UX people without the experience. So it is your job, and hopefully today you'll, you'll leave with some really good tips and some really good superpowers that you can help those non-UXers on your team. Those can be programmers, those could be the business owners, analytic people, people in the marketing. And marketing people are your friends, but they're not, they're more in demographics, so there's a, there is some different learning things there. And the other hardest thing for any of us is you need to be able to accept criticism and understand that it goes back to failure. That even though your idea and you think you went through some different loops and came up with some tests and you know it's perfect for the product and it gets totally turned down, you, you have to move forward and just accept that as a positive you know, failure. And sometimes one little element out of that, the team might have pulled out and you might have, have found something that really made the process work. 
And seven factors when we're designing any product, website, a service, a redesign, and any of the processes that you really need to think to yourself, is it valuable? Is it useful? Is it usable? Is it findable? Can, is it trustworthy? I mean, people are going to trust this process to want to even attempt to try it. And um, desirable, and we always have to keep in mind accessibility. Um, that is accessible to all. Um, keep this in frame, you know, when we're working with, with, with products and, and stuff. I, I want to credit who I got this from. If anyone has really looked, user experience is so broad. It's so evolving. Um, there are so many processes out there. I was trying to find the best way for me to describe how I use the process and where I'm pulling from. And this was a really, I'm not going to tear this apart because what's most important here is this is a section I'm going to be covering. And this is somewhat, um, I'm going to talk about um, user research, competitive um, auditing, user goals, and um, moving on to sketching. And I'm pretty much going to be going just before we're going to get into testing. And I just want to push something, if you like what you see today, if you want to go beyond, because I'm all the early stages, there's a talk tomorrow, and um, which is going to go from the prototyping testing area, if you want to get more in depth to that, because my talk is not truly into that depth, um, and I'm into some different methods, you might want to look that out tomorrow. So that is testing user experience to increase success. And this is what I consider, and when I work with my clients and my um, user experience process, I bring in interaction design. Of course, I teach it at Champlain College with my students, but we also bring in usability. We need that, and we do usability testing. And design thinking, which is a really good process of learning create, to creatively solve problems. And my biggest thing, which would actually should be my center, is human-centered design. That's where we bring in the human side and realize that we're working for humans. And if I didn't talk about a little bit about user interface, we wouldn't be able to put all of this together, because that is a very important part of the user experience. So now I'm going to get on to sharing. I have 10 of my top superpowers I want to pass on to you. And the number one one is empathy. This one you need in every one of your processes. I have 10. You may not use any of these. You can choose in different situations for some projects. But this is the one you should always have. You want that ability to understand and share the feelings of others. You want to put on their shoes, put on their whole outfit, immerse yourself, and get and live their life. You want to feel their pain so that you know how to get them rid of it. And uh, Jesse James Garrett, I think everybody should print this out and have this behind their, their desk, is the responsibility of the designer is to step out of their own perspective, which is the hardest thing for us to do, to really exercise their empathy and really completely immerse themselves in the point of view and the sociological state of the person who will be using the product. That really sums up empathy. So the hardest point is setting aside your perspectives. Um, so you really need to take the time to observe um, and, and learn about your users. I'm going to talk a little bit about personas and doing interviews um, and, and, and different data, which, which will help build this foundation of your empathy. Um, and it goes back to you're going to have several groups of people. And you want to find those several those those different groups of people um, because they all have different thought processes. Um, and um, also, the key thing is these people are always changing. And you also any of the personas that you build, you want to build upon those. And as your product develops, you're going to find that you do have different types of people, or they have changed. I mean, people age. Um, there's all sorts of different reasons. Um, and then you can get to know people by doing empathy map. This is something by the, uh, the Nielsen Norman group. Um, I've, my slides are up, and I have all, all of my resources um, here so you can pull them. 
Um, I'm not going to go into detail, but this is a good, a good um, way to learn about the users. You learn what they say, what they think, you know, and this is helping you with the language and the words um, uh, that they use. And it's important to design for more than one user. I have a client, and I want you to think, just think in your heads, who do you think would be the key people for a senior center? I know one of the first things going to come in is a true stereotype. But I worked for a client, they were a senior center, and they were very, very unique. They did not have a center. They worked for three communities, it was three towns, and they used all the facilities they used um, within those, um, like the churches, the library, businesses donated space, and they had activities. Now before I share who some of the users are, and you might be thinking, do you also know that a senior citizen is anyone that's 55 and up? Most people are thinking 65 and up. So. When I went into the board to tell them who their users were, and they were trying to find a new way to communicate with their people and bring in new members, and at that point they had about 150 members. So this is a good example of why we need to know the various different types of people. We have Steve, he's an empty nester. He's 57, he thinks senior citizens are 65 and up. He's an avid mountain biker. Um, his last um, child just went off to college. He's lonesome. He wants to find something to do to give back into the community. And then we have Jenna. She's a family caregiver. Her parents live in this community. She lives an hour away. She has children that wants to do something with their grandparents. She would like to find out what could they do in the community together with their grandparents. And then we have some true members, which are retired couples. And there's a lot of couples that have moved to the area because this is up in Vermont, and they just they want to be in the outdoors, and they want to be athletic. And they are mountain bikers and hikers and snowshoers and, and stuff. But then there's Kathleen, who is 89. Her husband died five years ago. She lives at home alone. This is a remote area. There is no public transportation. As soon as I pulled her up, the, the president of the board stood up and yelled at me and said, how dare you stereotype us? And I said, well, listen, I said, but these are the people. She, she can't get out there. There's no transportation. She wants to get there. Three more members of the board stood up and said, she just described three of our members we've forgotten about. So in a sense, they had forgotten about a pertinent, important member. So we have now since developed and brought in transportation. So she is out there getting out. And there's 10 other people using this service, and it's free that wasn't there. So we designed another product. So you can go different ways and find more ways to grow your product by learning more and more about who you're designing for. And you need to conduct good user research. Forget about Google. We're talking about the human-centered process. We need to actually talk and communicate and interview the people that are going to be using the product. And as everybody knows, we have Jared Spool, which I'm really excited. Here is a keynote speaker after lunch. Um, he owns, he's the founder of the largest uh, UX consulting and research organization, and he found that two hours of exposure with one, with one participant is more valuable than 15 minutes with eight people. So we need to actually go out and, and visit our, our people that are using it. So data is not a substitute. You can use it. It's available. You need to interview your stakeholders. You need to interview the salespeople to support. <coughs> if you're a small company, you know, um, but get out and talk to these people. We need to, we need to understand it and, and know their, their passions and their pains. And you need to perform a competitive audit. A lot of people think that is a marketing you know, tactic, but it's not. I'm going to talk about um, labels. We need to learn the, la the language. So what are the strengths of your competitors? You know, we don't want to change it completely because if people don't know how the system's already working, we want to understand how some other processes are going and be able to improve it. Um, and you can use existing internet, just make sure you check your sources and stick with a lot of the industry um, associates and publications that are out there. Um, I want to get beyond demographics. We really want to know about these people. 
And you can do surveys and questionnaires and hold focus groups. I'm not going to go into it, but if after class I brought in my free, uh, to, to take a look at my favorite books, a lot of these books have some really good stuff to help you write your, your surveys and what type of interview questions to have. Um, there's some really good sources out there. And write an engaging pers persona. Don't do it all about, uh, all about demographics. I also brought in a couple here if you want to take a look at which are those four people. These were the per personas. Make them engaging. Set up some scenarios. Because you, when you're designing, you want this next to your desk. When you're thinking about how these people are going to interact. And that's how I thought about Kathleen and she can't get out. Then I asked, do we, is, there, is there a service? What can we set up? So we got a new team and we evolved and set up a whole new process um, to get people out to this event. Um, you know, things, you know, about um, the people, you know, not just the age, but, you know, you know, just channels. Where is he at? What's his technical level? Especially this type of, um, uh, of user group that I was dealing with, you know, we do have some that aren't into the technology, but more are because they are isolated. And it was really kind of unique. But this type of person, he can start creating new activities. There's now mountain biking. He takes mountain bike tours out. He didn't realize that there's a whole bunch of people in his age group that are considered seniors and that now they're organizing a lot more. Uh, we've gone from 150 in a year, 150 to 500 participants in the activities for the senior center just because of this work and learning um, what to do. But you can take a look at these to see more. Understand the, the interface, interface labels and messaging, how you choose your words. And understand labels. Are, are help your users understand their environment, um, like forms, you've got your login, your password, those are labels. And this is a good example of the good and bad. And one thing you should take away from day, today is don't use the word submit. That is such a generic um, input into the field that people never go and reset it. Think about what the person is submitting, what they're doing. It's more friendly and understandable as I'm creating my account. This way they know when they hit the button what they're doing. And the messages, are those error messages or anything helpful that you, um, your product communicates back to your users? Um, make sure that lingo is right. Don't use jargon that they're not understanding. Um, and this is another example too is just don't tell them failure without, what, what, what's the failure? sign an error. That's a much friendlier way. Um, so think about that messaging and how you write that. And that you can find out during your, you can do a competitive language audit at the same time that you're checking out your competitors. Um, and always keep it simple. Um, and remember, labels imply the outcome. And also, when you're doing your prototyping, don't use lower ipsum. Use the real words because we're going to be testing those. Use the lower ipsum for just the generic, what you don't want people to really read. And this is one of my favorite is card sorting. It's a process to help you group. How do people group it? How do they see it? This is a card sorting that I did for, for, for in my classroom for my students. I basically took the Champlain College's website and put all the words down, gave it to the students, and had them reorganize it. Of course, they were fumbled. They were students because there were sections that were set up for parents. They didn't know what to do with some of that stuff. At the same time, when I give them a project like this, I give them a stack of sticky notes and tell them, if you don't see a process there that should be there, Write it down and put it in. And if you don't like one, pull it out. So we have a pile of stuff that comes out, new stuff that goes in. And it's really interesting to see how people regroup the content. Um, you can also use this when you're trying to plan out your tasks. You know, how do people, how would people process through to sign into an app? You know, um, and think about different things they might need to do. So card sorting, sorting is a very, very good, um, and so this is an example of things just regrouped. And sketching. I don't know if anybody uses this, but everybody gets so scared 
and they think they have to be a designer and a really creative person to sketch. Sketching gets your ideas really, really quickly. It doesn't cost anything, and you can do it at any stage, at any time. It's one of the best brainstorming tools you can do. Um, and paper, napkin, whatever. Um, I frequently will do a five-minute sketch session when I'm sitting with a client and we're truly really trying to figure out where are we going to go with this? What kinds of tasks do we think we need to get through this process? Or what different screens you know, are we going to use? And so I force people, we do five minutes and I will set a timer and give them paper. And sometimes you can do this, take a piece of paper, fold it in half, because some people want to see a screen, and then you got four screens. So you can use just a piece of paper like this. And it's amazing when you're like, you don't have to draw. Sometimes you just have words. It doesn't have to be that fancy. But you've got it down quickly. And then after that five minutes, I tell them, pick out your best idea. So then they have to go back and think, oh, I did five different concepts or two. Spend five more minutes on that. So you're digging deeper and deeper. And look, you spent 10 minutes, and you probably, if you had five people in the room, you've come up with 100 different ideas. Or you find out that maybe... Most of you came up with some of the similar, and you're on that same right track. This is one of the most valuable, simplest tools um, you could add. So the task analysis, you will actually use this in testing. Um, a task flow, we've got task analysis, we've got task flows. Um, this is a smaller picture. These are more like the, the subtasks. And you want to map these out and chart these out. Um, there's a lot of different programs you can use to, to, to do these diagrams. Um, and it helps you sort through uh, the processes that people are going. And then once you get these set, you, you can actually go to wireframing and you wireframe um, these and then you can test these. Um, um, and you can go to low fidelity um, testing out of this. You're sort of mapping up what you what you have. This helps you target deeper into your users' goals, so you understand the different steps they have to go through. So you start feeling their pains, and you're actually at this point. You're with these tasks is you are actually starting to achieve, you know, meeting their goals. Um, and you're getting a sense of their previous knowledge um, when you walk people through these. And a lot of these you can do before you bring these out to the users. You would do these in your team. And it gives you a better sense when you start working with your users how complicated and you end up pulling out steps. It's kind of funny how sometimes you put too many steps in. And these tasks I usually say should be like only maybe five or seven steps to get through. And then the superpower number nine is now we're up to wireframing and prototyping. I pretty much stick to wireframing. I leave the, which is the low fidelity. Um, I'm really just sort of testing the functionality, um, the words. If you put too much into this, your testers that you're testing are going to spend too much time going, I don't like the blue. I don't like the, you know, this, or why'd you use that, that color? And they'll start reading into other things. So this is where you want to just use some really generic um, um, wireframing. And then you, you can draw your wireframes if you want. There's a lot of templates online. Some of my students preferred pencil, um, and they'll print these off. You can, you can get the watches, and you can get any phone that you want, and you can, you, you websites, and... Um, so you can sketch it. And then you can go to a high fidelity um, um, with it. This is just an example. Um, I use in my class um, mock flow. I don't know if anybody else what you use for making my wire frames. If you use a wire framing, what's really nice is um, if you go online, after you've gone through, you can put hot spots and I can turn this into a testing environment. Um, without having to recreate anything. And you can go to high fidelity afterwards. So that way you're building on it. You just save your, your original version. You make a copy. So you're not having to re-putting a lot of time in um, so that you're really working on the process. Um, I, have a couple, I have a resource slide at the end of this with a couple of resources for this. 
And then usability testing. This can be done in many ways. I do a lot of it with the wire framing. Um, you can actually do it in the paper, the paper way. You set up your tasks, um, your task list, and you, you need to observe, and you can't. I have so many people that be like, oh, well, they got stuck, and it worked really well because then I took over the computer and I gave them a walkthrough. I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's obsolete. I had this problem with this drop-down menu. I said, we can't use a drop-down menu. Well, why? Because all of our users, probably 70% of them are on our, on our iPad. And you know what? They can't do it. And when we have 50-some-odd items in a drop-down menu, it's not going to work. Oh, but see, it works for me. It's like, well, because you're on your laptop and you can type into it and whatever. So, um, so it was cool for them, but not, not for the users. Um, so, and you have to observe their faces when you're doing this because you'll see more pain. And um, ask them to talk out loud, because what's going through their thought is the stuff that you want to be writing down. Um, I also, I, I'm a word, I, I build WordPress sites, so sometimes I will just go to a really generic, you know, WordPress site with not anything, which is Laura Mipsum, and then I can give a, a business's employees to go play with it, whatever. So there's different ways that you can do the testing, and you know, but there's no not a lot of color, not a lot of imagery, and no real text. So we're just testing our labels and the flow and the tasks, and you can do tree testing. Which is, you know, if you wanted to do, for say, this would be like a site's navigation. Um, you can have you can have a, a set of tasks and have people point to where they'd want to go, and you know, kind of listen as they're going through. This is a preliminary. You do this before you get to any design, and you haven't, you know, spent any um, a lot of money. And this is what's nice about wireframing is you can then go and make it hot spots once you've, you've done it and you've got something that's testable and not to have to go back and spend time and money to go build. So my whole process of my superpowers that I'm passing on goes through this stage. And it's very iterative because you can keep going back. You know, if you're testing, you found something that you can tweak easily in the prototype, sometimes you, it just is total failure. And you have to decide what is total failure. Is it you know two out of five? Um, and um, and testing, you know, there's different rules. Um, you want at least if you have five really good true users, and that's all you have, that's a really that's a real that's really good. That's really good. Um, you know, bigger projects depending on what you have. Um, and all else fails when you get done. Does everybody know the superpower? The superhero pose. Grey's Anatomy did. Well, it actually was a study in 2012 by, by um, Harvard. Um, so if you really you know, re regroup or you didn't take that criticism right, you've got to restart. You can do that five-minute reset by just standing up and doing that Superman pose. Mm -hmm. And um, it actually helps you perform harder tasks, supposedly more measurably better. Mm -hmm. And then I put together um, some of my favorite resources. I don't know if any of you are members, are members of anything, but I highly recommend interactiondesign.org. Um, if anybody here has done that, um, it's not that expensive, and they do certification. They have some really great, great classes. I think, don't quote me, I think it's 115 for the year, and, but their classes are amazing. And you get a certificate, which really gives you some really good value. Um, I'm also a member of the um, User Experience Professional Association being down in this area. I don't know how many people are part of the Boston. Um, same thing that goes with that and that keeps you on top of conferences. Um, the template that I use for, in, for my personas um, is Extensio. There's lots of other options there. Don't put a lot of time into creating those own. Get a template built or, or service because you want to focus on your process, not on the creative stuff. Um, and I think it's $25 a month. You get one free template um, with that. It's $25 a month. And um, I just turn it on when I need it and I'm working on a project. And it's great. If the elements are there, it's drag and drop. It makes a really nice template. And I have samples up here. Wireframing, um, balsamic, which is something locally. Um, there's Mock Plus, Mock Flow, and there's a bunch of others out there. Um, highly recommend them. They're really, really easy to use. 
Usability.gov has a lot of really good information on, on user experience. Um, I reference that a lot. There's also some good um, um, processes as well. Um, and I put up user interface engineering, which is um, Jared Spool's website. He has some amazing uh, videos on experts of the industry. Um, there's, there's a monthly fee for it, uh, but he has a couple free ones, and it's definitely worth um, looking at. And then the, the um, Nelson Norman Group, um, they've been around for a long time and has really evolved and is really updated and has a lot of really good information and some um, processes that you can use as well. So, and the books I have, I have all the books here if anyone wanted to crowd through or just take a peek at them on their way out. Um, they're here for you guys to look at. Any questions? Hi, I'm Sharon. Hi. So, I mean, absolutely user testing, UX testing, all of that is so, so critical and, um, and, and underrated. But people outside of the profession, and even people in the profession, when they're thinking about dollars, a client wants to skip certain things like, just keep the cost down or your, your boss has more pressing things to do how do you how do you get them on board a lot of these are low cost that you can do that card sorting that doesn't take a lot of time also I did look up and I didn't get in my slides um, there was a recent study um, and I can't remember who did it that a company that brought in user experience processes over another company of similar product had a four times increase improved rate over those that didn't. So four times. So you do that four times a dollar amount, that could be really huge. Where did you get that? that, that? I will have to look it up, but I could um, um, uh, tweet it. So if you want to follow me, I'll tweet that out. And then there was another study saying that if you spent 10% of your budget, do you have any, I don't know, you're talking tomorrow, I don't know if you have any funds in your talk. 10% um, of the budget, if you plan just 10% of your budget to put towards this, you're going to have a much better, it, 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 you're going to have a, a successful project. So, um, so there is some statistics out there to do that. Um, and I have clients that just waste, wasted their money and did some redesigns and wouldn't do this. Then they came back to me, and then you know, two years later, when it's like we need a redesign, I said, "Can you listen to me?" <laughs> okay, because I only have like fifty, you know. And they're also the ones that don't believe in the marketing and paying for marketing. We'll do it ourselves, you know. And so we put a little time into it, and that's where these processes. My key takeaway for you guys is you can take these and you can educate the people in your team. I have worked in large groups, but I mostly work that I am the user experience only person. And so I've got the business owner and their employers, and, um, and I'm sorry if there's any here, but I've been running into problem with graphic designers. I've had two <laughs> that they, even though print, they say, and print isn't really dead, but they just don't understand that this material is different. When we're dealing with digital experiences versus something printed, you know, and so I'm having to really educate them. And when they get it, they get it. And it's such a much better process. So it's an educational process. Cut the monitors in half. Yes. <laughs> yes. Early in your talk, you spoke about how empathy is super important, and you also touched on the fact that it's really hard to have. Do you have any good tips for building that skill? It's hard. Um, that's where it, it's. That's where it comes into. Everybody has something to contribute, and sometimes if you have those people, there will be situations like that that they're contributing something. They might come up with something quite right, but yet it doesn't fit in with it. Um, and, and, and sometimes you just have to go with the flow. And you do have to keep bringing them back to, and that's why you send them away with one of these and say, well, you just think like this person, okay? Okay, just be this person, okay? And go resketch your ideas. And you don't want to be negative towards them because their input's valuable. And that's where in the beginning I talked about you've got to be able to take criticism. I mean, you, 
there's been times that I just wanted to put up the wall and just put somebody away because I knew they weren't going down the right avenue and the direction was wrong. But they're part of the company and they're part of this division and you know, and you'll find those that are data driven more than, you know, and, and some are in the old school of, you know, well we have all these the, this data and these reports and isn't this enough? But to you get out there and you sit with the people. Now I had students didn't know what to do, but I was looking at a situation for them. I said, go sit in the cafeteria, okay, there's write up your user questions. Your users are right there and ask them to come over. Can I talk to you for five minutes and ask them questions? Oh, so that's how I do it. You know, and when they did it a couple times, then, then they had to go interview, um, you, you know, then they interviewed, you know, parents. You know, they had to do different users, but, and they had to go get into their different environments. And we were working on another project with activity trackers. So I sent them all down, go down, go down and hang out at the gym, go down to the Y, go here. You know, sit and look at these people, you know, and then talk to them. And if someone doesn't have one, you know, ask if they've used one. What would they be interested in? Um, and so that was a whole interesting thing because I found out they're not into activities and athletics and sports, believe it or not, the 18 to 21-year-olds. But it opened their eyes why they see so many people using these that they took it in a new context. And then as students, they learned how they could use it as reminders and, and you know, and how exercise made them feel better. And it was, it was interesting. So it's putting them in, see if you can get them into that environment. Thanks. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit on topic, but could you give me some, uh, could you give us some advice on how to transition into this field from a different background mm -hmm. with interest in it but no experience? Like I come from a mostly a software QA background and uh, this seems a lot more interesting than software QA. Yeah. And uh, but I'm just kind of really confused about how do we effectively transition? Very good. Um, go check out interactiondesign.org. Go look at some of the courses that they're offering. They have design thinking. They have all sorts of some really good things. And if you can afford it, if you, if you shop around, I think they have a, st if you're a student, there's a student rate. But I joined, and I think it was 115 when I rejoined in the fall. Um, and you, you'll get certification, so you actually have something to give out. So if you're going to use it in your organization, they're going to trust you. Um, and go to conferences and do exactly this, ask questions. Um, and it's important, if we have more people like you out there doing it, it makes it much easier for everybody else's job. Because I, I am a believer that anyone can contribute, and if you're educated enough, you're a valuable, valuable part of the process because you come from an under, other end, so if you're a programmer, you, you know, the feasibility, you can help us with that. And if you understand what the feeling is up front, then you, you'll change some of your processes as well. Um, but yeah, just keep going out, asking questions, and I think interaction design has some good stuff. Um, and um, joining, there's some stuff too on the, the user experience professionals. I think that's $69 a year to be a member for that. And then you get all the conferences and stuff that are happening in the area and stuff um, to go to. Just keep educating and learning. <laughs> Any other questions? I don't remember which one of the superpowers you showed it for. I want to say it was eight or nine, but you had pictures of these beautiful paper prototypes where it looked like a little tablet, had the tabs and everything. And I was just curious, A, if you had any more pictures, B, if you could elaborate on your paper prototyping. Oh, the paper pro... Oh, there's so many different ways you can do it. You can do screenshots. So you could use one of the wire framing. They don't take very long to learn how to do the wire framing because it's pretty much drag and drop your stuff. They're, they're pre-made, the elements. And you just go put the labels and you can type over it, whatever. Um, so the paper prototypes... Um, you can bring in the screenshots. So if you've got a, uh, and just bring, bring them in, and you give the first, the first say, say it's a website, so you put down the home, the home page and you ask them, you know, okay, I want you to go upload some photos in your, your account. And so you'll see and you'll document where they go, whatever they, they point their, picture, their finger on, then you put down, you'll have all the different screens made okay. up. And so you do that. 
um, which is great. And that type of stuff you're testing, you're only going to have five or seven because you want to test like these simpler tasks um, because there's subtasks within you know the different user flows, and you can. There's different elaborate ways, and you could also do it just with words. If you just want to see how people are going to recognize and go through, you can do it just as, as words. Is that helpful? About yes, the, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Some people like the, 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 the paper. Um, some, I'll bring in paper if I'm sitting with a group of people with somebody's employers, and we're going to be walking through it, so it's just sort of easier. Um, to do it and um, and just watch how they go through it. So you don't have to get so elaborate. And the, and the whole key thing is you're not giving them any imagery of, of what to look look at. So I think the image you were looking at was this one. Yeah. Yeah. And some of these, if it's one screen, you just replace a sticky note with what if they clicked on it, what the screen, what will the next message would be. So it's kind of what some of these labels on the side are, and see the sticky notes were put up. So they just did one, you know, interface page because they're going to dealing with one, and just to see how things work. This works great if you're checking like error messages, you know, to see if they understand, you know, those help messages, um, you know. So if they do something wrong, what happens when, you know, and if they hit the wrong thing and there's supposed to be an error come up, you put that error message in, and you see what they do and they do with it. So. Um, um, but a lot of these you can do, there's templates, and if you go to any of those and, and you do up some wireframing, you can just print out page by page. Um, and those wireframes, too, are really nice because they've gotten really good. You can email them to people. Um, I've had people just hold their phone for me periodically because they're like, okay, I'm going to put you over here, and I'll ask them a couple questions so I can kind of watch what they're doing, you know, whatever, um, and so you can sort of track things. Okay. Uh, and do you utilize any any tools, or what is your process after the product has been created? Like, suppose we've done with design what we consider a good design, we launched it, and do you use something to collect like real battlefield data also? How people in real life use the product? With? Yes, you can do hot spots. Uh, tomorrow, uh, I think he's going to have the talk more on that. Um, and you can set up a lot of stuff with your Google Analytics so that you can see if they're, you know, how far they're going. This is where um, marketing can kind of come into as well, um, and you can track it. And you also can send out, you know, surveys. Um, so you do do a lot of follow up even after this process. Um, when you, uh, I was trying to find that one screen that shows it all. Um, So the part, this is what I talked about, and then he's talking about the parts after. So then you would go into measurable and everything. Um, and so, yeah, and you might end up coming back. So, yeah, you, you do more testing. So this is all that preliminary before you, wait, you put all that money into that final really look. I think there was one other question there. Um, suppose you're a programmer and you've been tasked with um, a job that requires some uh, user interaction design. Um, do you have any advice on how to jump from thinking in terms of how to do things to versus what people need? You know, in the short term, like, not really, uh, that's basically what happened to me. <laughs> um, are you talking about maybe how they flow through what you do, or? Yeah, yeah stuff like that, and um, I've been given a specific task, but um, there's someone open-ended on, yeah, how people, yeah, how do you, how do you stop thinking about or put aside from all I'm thinking about. And were, were you given a guidance of the type of users, some, some idea of who they were? Um, I, I have a whole mess of emails that people have asked for. <laughs> <laughs> so people have asked for stuff. So I, I could probably look through the emails to see what people are asking for and what they're getting from. See, that, that's, that, would, that would be helpful because if you knew the types of people, I don't know what you're doing, but... Um, you know, it, the, their level of technology, it goes back to, so you know, like, that labeling and messaging and where you can put that help in if they get stuck, you know, as a programmer, you have to think about those paths, right. and that's what a lot of the whole user experience is, is not just to get from A to B, is, you know, understanding, you know, there, sometimes there's more than one path to get there. Um, okay. Oh, so, so you might have different users, each takes a different path? Exactly. Okay. 
Yeah, and, and your language um, can really help by, if you can look at some, I, is there other like competitors and products that you can look at that are similar that you can kind of walk yourself through and see how they have done it? Um, I could try to see about that. Yeah, that, that might be good. That would be really helpful. Okay. Um, you know, and it, especially if you know it's successful and it's been out there for a while. Um, and that's a really key thing because you don't want to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. You know, like people, you know, know how to sign on. But if you change that sign on process and make it more complicated, they're just not going to sign on anymore. Yeah. Um, but see how everybody's putting them through that sign in process for that product. Okay. You know, if, you know, what does it entail to get to your profile? What is included in your profile that you can update? You know, think about all the things that somebody might want in that profile. Right. So those are the things you're thinking about. And that's based on the type of product, too. So you've got to think, you know, what screens and, and, and what's there. And all right. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Feel free if anybody wants to take a peek or if no, um, they're all on my last slide. Oh, and I'll tweet out the link. Um, I was thinking Yeah, Media, they're big I love these books. Oh, um, they're really good. This is all, this is, there's an updated version. We just updated it. Um, I have some stuff that I buy usually, but I need quick but when I do come through, I like to sit in my lap. Yeah, and I think the clients, you know, trying to find that spot. I think I presented that one of them. The first one. Oh, yeah. I bet you did. That came from sure. That sounds right. I just wanted to, to share some uh, labeling stories. I'm from a public library background, and um, so, you know, we had language in the system. Like, the patron's account had expired, and, and, and you know, that message would pop up, patron has expired, and people would be like, what does that mean? What do you I know. Mean? And then I um, had several people, several users, these are, you know, low-tech people who don't have computers, they're on, they're coming to the library, and, you know, the uh, site would pop up an illegal operation, yeah. and they would be like, oh! I didn't do anything illegal. Or oh, I know. It's scary. Yeah. And yeah. that's setting off emotions. Right. And, and I mean, for us, want. we know what that means. We don't take it seriously.